Welcome everyone. I'm Heather Topsick, Director of Research Collections at Bard Graduate Center, and I'm delighted to convene the first of two brown bag lunch Zooms for our Library Artists in Residence program. Today we'll be hearing from Jasmine Katasis. A quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. Jasmine will speak for about 30 minutes and then we will open things up for questions and discussion. For the question and answer session, please use the Q&A function. We also have a number of colleagues joining us as panelists. And for the panelists, please use the raise hand function and then I will call on you to unmute so you can ask your question. We also have automatic captioning, which you can turn on using the CC option at the bottom of your screen. Though we are meeting virtually today, I'd like to begin our gathering with a land acknowledgement. Bard Graduate Center respectfully acknowledges our presence in Lenape Hawking, the ancestral homeland of the Lenni Lenape, and recognizes New York City as a past, present, and future crossroads for many indigenous people. In addition, we would like to acknowledge those whose ancestors did not arrive on these lands of their own free will and whose tremendous cultural, economic, and technological contributions continue to provide the foundation for our lives. Before introducing today's speaker, I would like to share some background on the BGC Libraries Artist in Residence program. Now in its fourth year, this program was developed as part of a wider institutional effort to bring artists in conversation with our gallery exhibitions and other institutional initiatives. The specific objective of the Library Air program, as we call it, is to invite visual or performance artists who are, whose work is grounded in research to use our collections as an incubator for new work. Artists are invited to conduct research in subject areas relevant to their practice or to address the library collection as a concept or an institution, utilizing the, the library's reference staff as partners in this process. The resulting collaboration creates a unique opportunity for artists and librarians alike, while highlighting the distinctive aspects of our research library and expanding Bard Graduate Center's relevance to a new audience. At this moment, we are halfway through this year's residency, which will culminate in an exhibition embedded into our library, which will open in mid-May, so stay tuned. Despite ongoing COVID restrictions, this year's artists, Jasmine Katasus and Lizzie Mineo Gonzalez, have managed to make regular research visits to our library this fall. And these work in progress talks are an opportunity for them to share their process and where they are in their projects. With that, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Jasmine Katasus is an artist and educator primarily working with print and paper making. She's currently an MFA candidate at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and holds a BA from CUNY Hunter College. She was trained as a papermaker at Pace Paper and Dudenay Paper Mill. Jasmine has taught printmaking and papermaking workshops at several institutions, including Dudenay, the Center for Contemporary Printmaking, the International Print Center of New York, the Museum of Modern Art and the Noguchi Museum. Her work has been exhibited nationally, most recently at Blackburn 2020 in New York City and the Morgan Conservatory in Cleveland, Ohio. She's currently the studio coordinator at the EFA Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop, a printmaking technician at the Cooper Union School of Art and serves on the board of Hand Paper Making Inc. With that, I'd like to turn um, the floor over to Jasmine, welcome. Thank you, Heather. Um, hear me okay? Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining me for this brown bag lunch. Um, I will speak a bit about my ideas of proposal entering this residency at BGC, um, a bit about my practice and describe my journey and kind of where I am now midway through this uh, residency. So Ritual of Ornament is an exploration in the role of ornamentation in building knowledge systems. It delves into how we manipulate matter to enhance political power, to affirm identity, or to connect with the cosmos. I'm interested in the actions that we take to include the decorative in our lives um, and how it functions in a psychological and physical space. Um, I am an object-based object artist um, based in Brooklyn, New York, 
my background is in uh, printmaking and paper making. Uh, so my practice is mostly concerned with paper fiber, um, whether it's in the form of paintings. Here's a painting of fine. The paint that you see here is um, actually paper pulp. Um, also make prints. The image to the left is a handmade paper. It, although it's not technically considered a print, it's because it's all made of paper fiber, it is addition. And the image on the right is a traditional etching and uh, sculpture, where I also include found objects. The undercurrent of my practice is to examine the act of ritual and how objects oscillate between the sacred and the profane. I look at the ways certain material are used to enhance an object so that it is imbued with sacred meaning. And also how the process of making can be understood as a mode of knowledge. Um, what kinds of knowledge are embedded in the objects through the process of making. My most recent and ongoing project is the Patois Relic Series, which is uh, the piece uh, that is up right now. Um, and it addresses the intersections of material objects and spiritual practices by bringing together concepts of Catholic rituals and decorative objects significant to Black and Latinx femme cultures and traditions. Uh, the focus of this project is to center Black femme narratives while drawing on Catholic ritual and decorative practices as a framework to discuss shifting morphologies and mythologies within the diaspora. So uh, in this series, I'm thinking a lot about the Catholic ritual of consecration, which is the act of declaring something sacred. Um, I'm really interested in Catholicism. I'm not Catholic. Um, I did grow up in Catholic school, so I'm very, very well acquainted with the religion. And uh, um, I think a lot about spirituality and religion in general in my practice. I double majored in, in art and religion in my undergrad. So it's something I think a lot about, a lot. Think about a lot. <laughs> um, so uh, I began to kind of thinking about this this project, the idea of consecration, the acts and rituals that we do to make something sacred, how we take mundane objects and move it into a sacred space during a, um, a trip to Spain, while I was traveling in Spain. I visited the Cathedral of Valencia and I encountered the relic of St. Vincent de Saragossa, which is the saint's arm in this beautifully crafted ornate box on a silk pillow. And I began, I started to think, okay, well, there's something more that we do to express that an object is wholly other, right? That the object is sacred by just, folk, more than just vocalizing it. Um, and, to me, the decorative and ornamentation works when, in this case, uh, to take this mundane object and, and put it into a really crafted box that's really well cared for um, to communicate to parishioners that this is something holy. Um, so that process of working with material, man manipulating material, um, is really in, is really integral to moving objects from profane to the sacred. So the process of materiality and um, and process in general is really paramount to my practice. Uh, my ritual in making work lies in the reconstruction of material. In this case, paper. Um, here's some studio shots of me. Um, paper is a really fascinating material to work with because it is kind of like alchemy 
right? It's like liquid and then it's solid, really malleable. So um, yeah, the ritual is really important. And I, in my process and the reconstruction of material that results in a tactile object. Um, so as a printmaker and paper maker, the experience of touch and feel is just as important as a visual outcome. So these were the ideas I was entering the library with. So the first thing I thought about was material. Um, and I encountered a book titled, uh, um, religion and material culture. Um, the, let's talk about the stuff that we manipulate to express sacred and the knowledge that the material holds. And objects, I believe an object's life doesn't begin once it leaves the atelier, but the moment that the maker begins making it. And the knowledge that comes from the object is embedded with not only, it's embedded not only how the object is utilized, but how it's made. And knowledge is transferred from the maker's body and labor to the material, which imbues the object with meaning. Um, and as an artist and craftsman myself, I believe this to be true. So I approach making as a form of devotional practice and as ritual. Um, as ritual is defined as a act or series of acts regularly repeated in a set and precise manner. So yeah, this book, uh, Religion and Material Culture, The Matter of Belief, I um, read an essay by scholar Marie Nutter Roberts titled The Tacti Tactility and Transcendence, Epistemologies of Touch in African Arts and Spiritualities. Um, and she used this term haptic visuality and that really resonated with me. Um, here's another image of my Petra Relic series. She says, uh, haptic visuality is the eyes themselves function like organs of touch. It is within the gaze that links spirits and human realms in transcendental intersubjectivity that enable insight and efficacy. Um, the materiality of objects speaks to our senses and ties us into a vast narrative that is rooted in the transformation of natural material. Artists compress and condense memory into physical matter. So each material that I choose, the various fibers, um, bound objects, uh, even printing, whether it's plate or stone, um, lend to the haptic visuality of each piece that evoke a metaphysical sensation. It is through this material and work devotion that I explore black aesthetics through adornment. Um, divisional, devotional making is a non-material offering and sacrifice. Um, ornamentation in this case to me is the spiritualization of matter. So, uh, you know, what am I bringing to conversation with these projects, uh, specifically using the earrings? Um, what does it mean to explore Black aesthetics through adornment? Um, so these are just things I'm thinking a lot about um, while I'm at the library. Um, so the uh, door knocker earring, which I've been working a lot with recently, and you can also see here, um, sometimes called the bamboo earring, uh, are ubiquitous in Black American and Latinx M culture, uh, made popular by Black women in hip hop in the 90s, 80s and 90s. Um, see here, salt and pepper. Um, so when I think about this object that's so common um, to me, you know, I think about when I think about them, I think about my mom and my aunties in the 90s, probably most black girls in the US get a pair at some point in their life. I had a little pair when I was a kid. Um, 
So to me, they're like a, a marker of identity or adornment. And these, so when I'm elevating these earrings on the platform and wrapping them and, and, and intersecting the ritual of consecration and bring this into a sacred space, you know, it's social and political because these earrings or black women wearing these earrings were seen as ghetto or unprofessional. Um, but it's also such a, a, a specific thing to black female culture. So to me, taking the earring, putting on the platform, wrapping it is a devotional act. It's a precious act. Um, and that's how it can be moved from a everyday mundane object into a sacred space. Um, you, there's care that goes into it as well. So when the paper fiber that you see here, the abaca sheets of paper are in the wet state before it dries, they're quite fragile. Um, so it's, it's a really special moment. Um, so in this project, I'm aiming to centralize Black aesthetics and scrutinizing Euro-Catholic rituals, decorative practices. Um, so I'm considering the religio aesthetic of Catholicism, but also kind of bringing forward a Black religio aesthetic as well. So that's um, a bit about my work and what I'm working through. Um, so my experience at BGC took me to a place I didn't think I would end up, or not end up, the residency is still going, but I, I didn't expect to research certain things. So I'm thinking about Catholicism and ornamentation. So it led me to the Baroque, <laughs> Baroque architecture, which I haven't thought about since, you know, undergrad 12, 15 years ago, my Renaissance architecture course. Um, so yeah, anyways, thinking about decorative and Catholicism, like how can you not think about the Baroque, the, the overly decorated cathedrals, um, the opulence, um, and I became, began to learn and understand that ornamentation, not only a mark of identity, but can also be used as a tool of propaganda. Um, and through my research at BGC, I came across um, a part of history in the Catholic Church called the Council of Trent, um, where the Catholic Church decided to adopt Baroque style architecture and art in response to the growing Protestant Reformation. This council took place um, in 1545 and met 25 times over 18 years. Um, and it's also in this council that the, Cal the Catholic Church made decrees on the veneration of relics, which I thought was amazing because that's the title of this series, part of the title of the series, and also decrees on original sin, which I'll, I'll get to. Um, so yeah, this, the, the results of this council was, is uh, the vast and powerful looking structures that broadcast a certain power um, spiritual and political agenda of the Catholic Church. And this cathedral here is um, Santiago de Compostela, also in Spain, that I've also had the privilege of visiting. Um, it's just so over the top when you go in. Um, gold everywhere. It's a really amazing experience. Um, but it's also in this, during this trip in Spain and visiting the cathedrals, I, I thought a lot about the decorative and ornamentation and what it's communicating. Um, 
So I'm thinking a lot about the decorative and now I'm thinking about the Baroque and, and my project, the Pato Relic series. And, um, you know, starting to think about black aesthetics, right? You know, what, what does that mean? What is overarching like thread of black aesthetics? Um, so that's kind of where I am researching now in, in uh, the library. Um, flex the aesthetic and spiritual practices. Um, so it led me to um, find uh, this book called Aesthetics of the Cool by Robert Ferris Thompson, which is this book I've been trying to get my hands on for a little while now. So it's exciting. Um, and it goes through Afro Atlantic art and music. Um, so in the second essay, The Sex of the Cruel Two, um, Robert Ferris Thompson um, is describing uh, West African um, spiritual based systems. And he speaks about the origin of the soul in these spiritual based systems. And uh, the soul is defined, he defines it as a uh, divine spark of equilibrium. So I thought that's that's a that's cool in contrast to the Catholic origin of the soul, original sin. Um, for those of you who aren't Catholic or aren't familiar with Catholicism, um, original sin is a state. It's the condition of sin that every soul is born with. Every person is born with. So we're born with sin. Um, so I thought about. Like, what are the, what are the aesthetics out, output of uh, this way of thinking, right? Uh, the soul in West African traditions balance equilibrium, their soul, sinful, born bad. Um, and he continues in this essay and uh, writes a Ghanaian proverb, uh, A person out of equilibrium can win back his soul by means of extraordinary aesthetic persuasion. I thought, wow, that's amazing, right? We're using ornamentation in this sense. Ornamentation connects with the spiritual realm, um, with the cosmos, right? If your soul is out of balance, just you know, look pretty, make your space pretty, or decorate. Um, so uh, I thought this was a really exciting moment um, at BBC for me. So now, I, now in my research, I am just looking at visual overlaps between uh, Catholic decorative practices and that of the Afro-Atlantic. Um, and uh, so I'll just show a few images. Uh, that are exciting to me. So the image on the left, I, I actually took um, <laughs> you set, you set some door knockers on this red velvet background. And you can often find these in like black and brown neighborhoods. We buy gold stores or even uh, vendors, street vendors up in Harlem I see sometimes. Um, the gold and the red velvet juxtaposed to the Catholic altars, the red velvet and the gold. I thought that was very, very fun. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a great book that I, I refer to a lot, the library, um, Opulence and Devotion in Brazilian Baroque Art, um, thinking about Catholicism, not only in Europe, but in the Caribbean and South America, right? And how that overlaps with Black aesthetics and um, the history of, of Black folk. Some more overlaps that I found. Um, this is a throne from Benin, Oshimare. Um, and on the right, uh, Oradorio also found from the Brazilian, the Baroque Art Brazil book. Yeah, that was fun. Um, same, both are in Brazil. Um, a, 
alter to issue, it's an Orisha um, in Bahia, Brazil, and on the right, uh, interior of a cathedral in Brazil, um, golden red. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about visually what I'm also building for this installation. So there might be, there's gotta be some golden red. Um, so this final image, I was a bit apprehensive sharing, but this is kind of where I am with my research now, what I'm making. Um, but I think this describes a really great moment. Um, and what's exciting about this residency. Um, so the image to the right is um, a illuminated manuscript. Um, also something from Catholic decorative practices. Um, so I'm referencing the manuscript um, in, in my piece to left, and it is an embossing and imprint um, of lace. And I've been working with this lace for a while um, in my practice. It shows up in some of my pieces, um, actually in the etching in the beginning, it shows up but I've kind of shelved it because I, I couldn't really work out how to conceptually bring it into my practice. I just knew I really loved this material. Um, and it wasn't until I encountered a book at BGC titled African Lace, A History of Trade, Creativity and Fashion in Nigeria. I thought, uh, okay, this will come back out of the woodwork. Um, when I think about this lace, I think about the Nigerian women um, at church when I was younger. Um, but I think this falls under the same lines of uh, material that is specific to a certain culture, um, a Black femme culture, and uh, um, adornment, and having it in conversation with. Um, Catholicism, so this, or their Catholic decorative practice rather. So this uh, book describes the history of trade and the development of this lace in West Africa, specifically Nigeria, um, appropriation, um, post-colonial histories. Um, I'm, I'm still working through it, but uh, I think this is where I'm going with now in my residency and that I hope to install in the library. And uh, um, I will end off here with some more of uh, my pieces from the Patla Relic series. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jasmine. Should I, um, should I stop, I'll stop sharing. Great, thanks Jasmine. That was such an amazing, beautiful presentation. Um, we will now get started with the Q&A portion and I wanna invite um, a panelist to turn on your cameras and um, use the raise hand function um, to ask your questions. And I wanna remind um, all other audience members um, to submit any questions that you have um, via the Q&A function and then I can read them off. Um, but I will um, take the liberty of kicking things off with the first question <laughs> for you, um, Jasmine, something I've been thinking about, um, you know, during our conversations that we've had in the library and certainly um, that came up again in your talk. And I'm just really um, curious about your description of kind of embodied knowledge and learning, which is such a big part of your practice, you know, the kind of um, especially as a paper maker, like working with the materials and having this, um, you know, haptic experience with the materials as a kind of way of both, you know, receiving knowledge and transmitting knowledge. And also, you know, as an artist who's been working in the library, now doing kind of more traditional scholarly research, you know, reading and ingesting things intellectually and writing, um, you know, how do those two sort of modes of understanding um, kind of work alongside each other, or do they come into conflict, or sort of how do you how do you bring that all together? Um, I think both sides are very important 
uh, I recently read this book that helps me articulate a bit more um, this, these ideas. Uh, it's called Sensuous Knowledge um, by Mina Salami. And she is writing about modes of knowledge and way of, of learning um, and holding knowledge. And she describes a, a, a Yoruban uh, tradition um, or Yoruban mythology where she speaks about two types of knowledges that people have, that we should have, knowledge of the head and knowledge of the gut. Um, and she called knowledge of the gut sensuous knowledge and knowledge of the head a more like technical knowledge, learning knowledge. And for me, it is, it's, it's both as a paper maker, there's definitely like a, an embodied gut knowledge that comes with working with the middle. Um, it obviously started as like a head knowledge because it's very process heavy. Um, so there's a lot of things I have to learn in the beginning, but now it's, I've kind of learned to, I've, I've developed this relationship with the material that I can, you know, it's not only me, but it's also working with this material. So for example, the, the Abaca, it's a fiber that I'm using in this project. Um, you know, you can, the longer you beat it, the more translucent it becomes, the higher shrink it, the shrinkage, shrinkage it has, which, you know, gives it the whole like wrapping tight feeling. Um, but it's also unpredictable in many ways. It depends on the humidity, on the environment. And there's a cracking that happens when I'm making the pieces and I kind of just let it be. Like that knowledge, I just like let it flow and exist. Um, but it's also supported, but my practice also supported by a knowledge of the head reading and researching um, that it's, yeah, it's definitely both, both knowledges. Do, do you ever come across things in the reading where you're like, that's not, that, that's not my experience or that it, it sort of creates a conflict for you or? or no, I think all experiences are valid. Um, and I think that is what sensuous knowledge is. It's like all experiences are valid, not only, a, like historical told knowledge, just like intellectual knowledge, but um, visceral knowledge is also a um, just as valid. Great, thank you. I have a couple of questions from the Q and A. Um, I wanted to share um, from Chantal Lee. Um, she says, "Thank you so much for your incredible presentation and beautiful work." Did your practice include research as an ongoing part of your process before the residency, or did having an artist residency in a library environment enhance this aspect for you? It, thank you, Chantal. And yes, um, I do think that a lot of my practice is research based, but being at the library actually enhanced it because I have access to wonderful art librarians to help me um, find things that I wouldn't have by myself. Um, and really, I mean, I think the African lace experience was like a perf like perfect example of this. Like I didn't know, I knew I had this like desire to use this material, you know, I'm in like fabric stores and there's only so much in, like information I can find on the internet. Um, but encountering that book where I can learn about the history and I can learn about the trade of this textile and how it lives in a part of the world that I am not acquainted with um, really enforces and enhances like my use of this material in my practice. I've really put like pulled it out of the woodwork. I was like, oh yeah, that thing. <laughs> I want to keep going. Drew, I see you have your hand up. Thank you so much, Jasmine. I was just wondering if you could comment on your um, stylistic choice to cover the earrings or to kind of wrap them um, and what types of debates or what kinds of choices are you confronting in that artistic practice? And then also just as a subset of that, 
I was just wondering where are you hoping to push this field or discussion around um, Black aesthetics? Um, so my choice to wrap it is because I want to communicate that this is something special. You know, like this is rap because it is almost like, don't touch it, be very careful. This is expressing something that is really um, holy, right? Um, and so it, the rapping is, is really important to me visually to communicate that. Um, and where am I hoping to push, I'm sorry, the conversation of Black aesthetic? Yeah, you know, that's something that I've been working through. Another um, text I encountered at BGC was uh, a article by Dr. Marta Morena Vega um, about the, about a global, is, is there a global Black aesthetics? And she uses the concept of Ache. Um, to describe this kind of global black aesthetic um, that is a, a um, kind of unnameable metaphysical force that is expressed in a, almost every creative action um, a black person does that from Africa through the Caribbean to where I am now. So it's a lot about my practice is investigating, you know, is there a global black aesthetic? What is a black aesthetic? Right. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Barb, I <laughs> see so you have your hand up too. Hi, um, thanks Jasmine. Um, that was a really great talk. Um, very interesting to hear you talk about your work. Um, I, I spent a little bit of time looking at your work before knowing a lot about it. Um, and saw the pieces with the earrings and, you know, initially thought, is this teeth, you know, is this, um, are these um, gilded frames, are they bones? I mean, it was hard to identify them at first. And then I did figure out what they were. And I was reminded of, um, before I worked at the Bar Graduate Center, I worked at the Museum of the City of New York, and there was an exhibition called Black Style Now. And they sold those horseshoe earrings in the, in the uh, gift shop. And a friend who'd worked on the show bought me a pair and said, you have to wear these to the opening. So I wore them and they were very heavy and I was not used to it. And I was thinking about your sort of rite of passage, um, women getting these earrings and wearing them. And if, it, if there is any sort of suffering wearing these very heavy things, um, or am I completely off the mark? I was just thinking of <laughs> you know, the Catholic, uh, all the symbolism coming in and, and the relics and, um, and I could be completely off base, but I was just curious. So. That's, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, hoops and large jewelry in general are, are also, I think, part of uh, Black fashion trends. Um, they're not gonna ring earrings aren't always often uh, heavy. They're actually hollow, some of them are hollow. Um, um, but I like that idea of uh, suffering in terms of, uh, a, a, from a Catholic point of view, where I think suffering is very, and guilt is a very huge Catholic thing. So that's why I, 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 it's a really interesting conversation in relation to what Robert Ferris Thompson was saying about um, the soul being a divine spark of equilibrium. So like from a, an inner West African point of view, there is no guilt or proselytization that someone has to go through. So I think um, when I am bringing into the conversation like a black religious aesthetic, it's, it's not so much about suffering, but maybe balance. Great. Um, in, from the q and I just, um, there's a comment uh, by Melanie Roll. She says, yes, the idea of ornament as worn on the body versus on display in other ways was a great, a great question to navigate. So kind of a, more of a comment on your yeah. 
Talk there. And then um, Nicholas de Godoy Lopez's question is I appreciate how you've drawn attention to how much decoration seems central to the highly important acts of consecration and rebalancing the soul. Have you come across discussions of decoration's paradoxical devaluation within Western aesthetics as superficial or even profane? And do you think this contrast is something that you may address in your work? Hmm. I have not come across that in my research. Um, my research has been very pro-decorative. <laughs> um, that's interesting. I, to think about it as, I'm sorry, you said uh, superficial. Um, and, or sure. even pain, you know, okay. the pain. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's, you know, it's more about the act of mm -hmm. decorating, right? The act of putting on lipstick and putting on makeup and sure it may be, it might be superficial, but there is a ritual act to it, mm -hmm. right? There is a, uh, I, I, I perceive it as a, um, I don't know, maybe it's all sacred. I don't know. I, I, I haven't come across anything like that, but that is something uh, interesting to, to, for me to think about. Yeah. It, it makes me think just as um, that question comes up, and I think I you had this conversation with Lissy, our other artist in residence, about um, Adolf Loos's um, uh, decoration ornament. Or were we talking about that? Because there's been that kind of, um, sort of more modern um, Western take on ornamentation, on ornament is something that is profane and to be avoided. So that's a whole other. Right. <laughs> I mean, hmm. right. So, you know, it, it is profane, it's official. And we're, you know, and we also bring in the conversation about like capitalist intentions and uh, um, also procreation from other cultures. Sure. That is not something I've, I've been thinking about, but I might. <laughs> Thank you. There's plenty of books in our library yeah. on that topic to explore. Kara and Minenti, who is a previous library artist in residence here. Um, oh. Hi, Jasmine. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I was kind of curious. I feel like we're talking so much about the library and the research and the ideas and the materiality of your work is so important. I was wondering if you have like a similar kind of dredging for objects and materials that you work with. Like you talked about the lace and how it's sort of like, oh, you had this thing. And then the research you did sort of like validated using that in your work but I was wondering like if it kind of like works the opposite way too I'm kind of th I think I'm like curious your materials are so interesting sort of like how that process works um I tend to not use I mean uh, you're an artist so I feel like you know we probably have the same habits of like collecting things, <laughs> stuff. Um, but I, I do refrain from using objects that don't support me conceptually. Um, but even uh, I think texture is enough conceptually, right? If I'm like, oh, this is a really beautiful texture. Um, and then I'll probably go into a rabbit hole through research at our graduate center, <laughs> why I like the texture or what this texture is expressing to me. What is the knowledge that this texture, color, whatever, even color, like I've, I've uh, there's a few books on my shelf just on color, history of blue, uh, black, uh, red, you know. Um, but yeah, it, it, to, to put it forward in my practice, I have to think about it a bit deeper. Antonio, hello. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi, Jasmine. Thank you so much for this very interesting yeah. talk and thank you for showing us your beautiful work. I was, when I was looking at the um, 
ideas of looking at churches and you know the baroque uh, i was also interested in those metaphors of the body of christ as the church of the as the body of christ and also these metaphors that appear also in manuals of urbanity and good manners about the body as a temple mm -hmm. um and I was I was wondering if that's something that you, you have come across because it's also interesting how in the wording of these manuals and of these um, books of that is um, a narrative of the whiteness and the purity of the soul that also in many ways can be translated in some context of the whiteness of the skins and who has the power within the churches to predicate and to provide certain kind of knowledge and information. So I thought it was, I wonder if you have come across that and how it could maybe reflect in your work. Yeah, I, let's, uh, I was having this conversation with a professor of mine about tea or that the idea of like purity and whiteness of body. Um, but I actually think it's opposite in Catholicism. I think the decorative is to cover up all the sin and the guilt. I feel like the idea of purity is what they're trying to express to the parishioners to, <laughs> to gain support and keep support. But it's really gold, like, decorative and golden to kind of cover up the sin and the funk. I, I have a, a question about, you talked about growing up in um, Catholic schools and, and so, you know, is the Catholic church that was affiliated with your school or that you were connected to as a child, like also really ornate in its interior architecture oh yeah i mean i remember in grad and grad school in grammar school um i mean we were all excited to go to mass because it meant no no class but the uh, you know i think about the i think specifically about one instance it was some celebration of the virgin mary um and it was a big thing it was in the spring and one girl from every class would get a bouquet of flowers and like lay them at the statue of Mary and that the whole church was just decorative and flowers and the incense it just so those are my memories of mass <laughs> is this uh, really ornate ritual action the the statues the stained glass um so then my earliest experiences with Catholicism Yeah, second grade. <laughs> Clearly formative, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I always thought, and you know, it was in contrast to growing up with my mother's family who are evangelical Christians. And there is no, there's no decorative, right? No saints worship. It's um, the idea of having a, a saint relic or objects that you are worshiping is, you know, seems like devil worship, right? We don't do that. So I always, I grew up with those, that contrast um, with like no, no decorative, no statues, no objects that represent God. It's just God and the Bible, evangelical. And so, uh, yeah, quite formative. <laughs> so I, if there are any more questions, raise your hand now or type them into the chat. We're just past the hour. Um, oh, we have one more. Oh, this just in from Joseph. Oh, Laura, it's populated. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hi, Joseph. <laughs> um, his, uh, he types in, I think of Orisha's Oshun with the images of gold, lace, and overlaying often found in Catholicism, the church, and spiritual practice, I think. In, um, Absolutely. Um, I didn't speak too much about it in this project, but I have other projects that I work on that include uh, um, Orisha practice and Santeria, which is my other side of the family. Um, I'm 
Cuban. And so I also grew up with um, Catholic statues, but also like West African and Caribbean altars, both in tandem with one another. Um, so which is I, I'm also thinking about as I get into like black aesthetics, right? Um, in my grandmother's house, there was like the Catholic statue that was in the living room with the Virgin Mary and, you know, Gabriela de Cobre and all this stuff. Um, and then in another part of her home, in actually other parts of her home um, was Eshu and um, other altars to Orisha. Um, so uh, there is, so in the second part of the, of my BBC, I'm, I'm encountering other books um, that focus more on this, like there's a sacred art of voodoo, sacred art of Haitian voodoo book that's really awesome that I'm really digging into. Um, I'm also Haitian. Um, uh, and in my previous work, so in one of the uh, Pachal Relic series, there is like a kind of a cross looking figure but it is not a cross, it's actually taken from a Haitian veve, voodoo veve, um, which are symbols that are associated with different um, deities. Um, and I have a whole print series that involves that as well. So yeah, yep, so you're right. <laughs> it's, it's all there. Um, Sebastian, I see you have your hand up. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the sort of meaning of paper in connection to like the door knocker earrings. Is there like a specific um, kind of like contrast there that you find interesting or meaningful? Um, you no, know, it's just my medium. <laughs> um, you know, I also because it's, it's it's such a process heavy uh medium so it takes a while to get to to make those those sheets like you know cutting fiber beating it it's probably like up until 10 to 12 hours so i can get to actually wrapping the pieces so it's just more of my practice of working with this material because i can just as easily wrap it in fabric right go to the fabric store but it's um that's the, the material that I've developed a relationship with. Um, from Matthew Michaels, a question, um, with the influences on art and aesthetics by the Moors, how have these influenced your art? I haven't really researched the um, art of the Moors yet, but I recently, <laughs> Um, that's like my next research uh, uh, project um, is uh, researching the history and trajectory of handmade paper um, from the East. Um, it was invented in China and moved from China to, to Japan through Silk Road to uh, the Middle East, or our world, and up into Spain and Europe. But during that time, it was um, still a Muslim caliphate. So there's like Islamic paper making that's between like East and Western paper making that makes its way into Moorish Spain. Um, so I've been reading a lot about recently, just very recently about um, the history of the Moors in Spain, specifically with the movement and history of paper. But I don't know much, I don't know much about um, more aesthetics or architecture. This is a um, comment by Chantal Lee, I think kind of what we were talking about a few minutes ago um, around the sacred and the profane and sort of purity. And she says um, that she's reminded of Titian's painting sacred and profane where the woman representing the sacred is nude and seen as pure and profane is dressed covered in fabric ornament. Oh, 
I should look that up. So, yeah, check that out. <laughs> um, and then um, Lissy um, says, great talk, Jasmine. Are there any other notable Patois objects besides the door knocker earrings that you've thought of casting as relics? And I, yeah, that's the. That's any it. other objects besides the door knockers? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm. Uh, <laughs> working with casting uh, uh, acrylic nails. So a lot of my inspiration also comes from being in beauty supply stores, um, which are a really a part of being a black girl. You know, you grow up in beauty supply stores. So that's like one of the places I purchased actually the door knocker earrings. Um, and uh, so besides that, the, the lace, of course, um, Yeah, that's it right now. But there's always there's always more stuff to collect and think about. And um, another uh, question from Jay Hayes. Thank you for this beautiful series and your research. Can you speak to your choice to call the series Patois? And what is the importance culturally and historically um, in your practice to call it that? What is the the uh, sorry, say the, the last part again. I think the, the question is sort of speaking to calling the series Patois and mm -hmm. the importance of culturally and historically to your practice of, right. of naming. So I did a Patois because I'm thinking um, about my own culture as a Haitian and Cuban um, woman. I mean, I'm American, I grew up here, but I'm thinking a lot about the um, like kind of the, the changing and fragmentation of cultures through generations. And so Patois, you know, to me, um, which is, you know, refers to like different dialects of common people uh, in a region language wise, but it also means to me like it's kind of morphing of uh, cult, like similar cultures in the same place. Like I experienced myself as a Patois as being Haitian and Cuban but growing up in New York, right? Um, so it it's kind of like a fragment of different cultures like put together. Um, and it is a term that's also very commonly used um, in uh, Caribbean languages, right? Um, so that's all kind of wrapped up. So when I say Patois relics, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this like overlapping of Caribbean culture-ness um, from my background. Um, but also fragments of like many cultures like brought together. Um, that is something that is that like, can be seen and understood as special and sacred and holy. So we are right at um, our time at 115. And so I know some will have to get to class. Um, so I want to thank you, Jasmine. This brings us to a, a close uh, for today. Um, but you know, we we'll appreciate you um, putting all of this together to share your work um, with us. And I also want to give a big shout out to my colleagues, Laura Minsky, Jen Ha, Nadia Rivers, and Maggie Walters for helping to organize today's event. A lot goes on behind the scenes. And my colleagues in the Department of Research Collections for supporting um, our artist research. And thanks to our panelists for joining us on screen today and, um, and to everyone in the audience for spending um, their lunch hour with us. Um, I, I invite you back to join us um, on Friday, this Friday, February 18th at 12.15. Um, and we will be back to hear from Lissy Mineo Gonzalez, whose talk is entitled Reckoning with Erasure. Um, and please stay tuned to see Jasmine and Lissy's final projects, which will open um, in the library this May, um, TBD on the details, um, but they should come with some additional uh, programming. So. Anyway, thanks to all of you and hope to see you at the end of this week. Take care. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, Heather.